Hello, welcome to Truth Not Tradition online Bible study for Monday, November 21st, 2016. I'm Tony Smario from uh, my father, brosal.org, YouTube channel. And I uh, apologize for being away the last week from the, uh, from the uh, shows, uh, but the, the computer went down about a week ago and I had to bring it into the shop. And right when I got it back, I, I caught the stomach flu that's been going around our little town down here. And I have been really sick for the last few days. And I'm just on the mend today. So uh, I'll try and get back to our normal, our regularly scheduled programming. But uh, also, I thought the election, the mania going on around the election demanded a little extra time put toward... Um, commenting on that and I still believe that I hope at least the few people that are listening to me regularly are seeing a different picture of America and and not being led by the propaganda that's bombarding people on all sides if you check out one of our subscriptions there Mr. Doom it's uh, a compilation of news stories from all over the world every day that someone's putting together that display, you know, the, the end time scenery that's going on in the world. And, and because it's so clear to us who have been watching closely and intently for so many years, that these things that are going on in the world aren't some arbitrary or organic happening. They really are the, the biblical end times playing out in history. I say that most Christianity has been fooled into what to expect, what their part is in it, and even fooled into understanding of their own faith. Because faith as it was taught to me in the fundamentalist sort of hypocritical Christian church that I was brought up in, you know, it was the believe in Jesus or go to hell. That's it. So that's what God created everybody for, was to send them to hell if they didn't find Jesus. And there's just, it's one of the most shallow understandings in the world, which is why it's been so heavily criticized in my life. And, and I say the reason the Bible study is very important right now is to get a grasp on what the scripture really says because I believe part of this end time um, uh -huh. events that are going to overtake the world it talks about this deception that would fool even the elect if that were possible it talks about many coming in that day saying Lord didn't we cast out demons and heal the sick in your name and Jesus says depart from me evildoer I never knew you who are all those people you know, who is the Laodicean church? I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's the church. That's believers. I don't see how we can read it any other way, reconciling the entire story. What was the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth? Yeshua, to be correct for those that know better, but we call him Jesus because we're used to calling him Jesus. So I like to think of it as a nickname. We're still talking about the same guy. But Jesus of Nazareth, you know, what was his teaching? He taught him, don't look at the riches the way other people do in this life. Store them up where no thieves break in to steal. And they don't corrode. If someone persecutes you, bless them. Someone hates you, love them. If someone slaps you, turn them the other cheek. The greatest among you will be your servant. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you, when, when you just, it's impossible for me now that I've put a little time into just reading it for myself and trying to frame it in a, in a context that I can believe because I was ready to not believe it when I saw what it produced as Christians. And so... The prophecies have always been what hooked me. And it's interesting how Revelation states that the spirit of 
this deliverer is prophecy. The spirit of Jesus is prophecy. So, you know, that, and I see why, because that's what anchors it all. It's the prophecy that allows you to realize that as hard as it is to understand and reconcile how to want to live like a servant, how to love giving your this life. Those who want to save this life will lose it, but those who give this life for my name's sake will gain eternal life. I mean, how, does, how do you reconcile that? In, especially in our modern world, in our brainwashed world of materialism and, and uh, material satisfaction as being the measure of happiness, the measure of success, the measure of worth, personal value rather than what kind of person you are. You know, and that's why the best you can do for yourself, I suppose, anywhere in the world nowadays is get out of the cities and get into the very small places of the world where human beings still value each other that way. Because if we're in the end times and, you know, the things that are coming down the road here are going to keep getting worse. This world's going to get worse. And so I'm trying to inspire myself and others to really follow Christ at the time when I believe it's going to get hardest to do so. I don't think it's, I think Christians who've sold themselves this Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and they really don't reckon up the, the carrying the cross part of it. James is understanding that faith without works is dead. Jesus himself commanding us to love our neighbor as ourself, commanding us to the idea of being a servant. I, I don't even know how to put it into words. It's such a difficult thing for, for my cultural heritage to imagine finding that to be the, the highest achievement of my humanity is to become a servant. But if you want to, you know, look at the teachings and not the tradition, this is what the guy was trying to say. And what Christians believe is that God raised him from the dead to vindicate him. That he was right. He was the one. He was the one with God's spirit. You know, if you want to believe born of a virgin and all the miracles, as I do, simply because I, I don't see a reason not to believe them yet. I don't believe in the rapture anymore because I realize it looks like a fabrication to me, like the believe in Jesus go to hell story. I mean, don't believe in Jesus, go to hell. That's all looks like a fabrication to me. To create this sort of hypocritical Christian that can kill their neighbor instead of love their neighbor, that can hate their neighbor for their lifestyle or their choices instead of love their neighbor, as if they're in the Old Testament. But we're not in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus said, I give you one command. All the law is summed up in this one we're not here to live the Sabbath forever. It was never meant to be that way. We're not here to slaughter bulls forever. The high priest has already entered the temple and done the work. That's the point. And he says, follow me. Love your neighbor. Don't hang on to your possessions. Don't be like everybody else. Don't measure yourself the way the world measures themselves. I mean, that's the real measure of Christianity, I think, not so much the believe in Jesus. Now, am I contradicting that you're not saved? No, I'm not saying that. You know, Jesus can save anyone he wants. And I think it's, it's going to be a surprise to fundamentalist Christians how many people Jesus does save and how many of them are on a, a different part of the stick than they thought they were. So I just think we misunderstand what saving is when Paul said, Anyone who believes God raised him from the dead and confessed it with his mouth will be saved. Yeah, you won't be condemned. You'll be saved from all your sins. Will you not pay for them? Will you not see them? Will the whole world not see what a selfish, self-centered, you know, un-Christ-like person you were while you ran around praising Jesus Jesus did this for me. Jesus brought me here. Jesus told me this. Jesus wants this and Jesus wants that for me. When the only thing Jesus really asked you to do was to sacrifice this life for him. So, you know, I think we all fall short on that and we're all going to feel it. And, and that's 
why we're all going to be tested in this end time period and why I think the Bible study is important to keep a grip on what the Scripture really says about a Jesus that really existed or might have existed versus a fabricated tradition that certainly did not is not true, can't be true. So, a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing for the next Bible study, I was trying to figure out which book I was most interested to go through next. And I, of course, I was drawn to all the potential prophetic books and trying to put interpretations into where we're at today. But I, I really think basic Christianity right now is more important since we do spend the time in the other part of our broadcast covering uh, the geopolitics and eschatological viewpoint of where we're at in this move toward the temple and the what what I believe the scriptures really might say is going to happen as opposed to the tradition of rapture and Christians going to heaven and everybody else all the Muslims going to hell the only other people in the whole world that know that Jesus is the Messiah and Christians got hate him got them all going to hell I mean of of all the people in the world that deny God and everybody I mean I guess God just wants these few hypocritical, rich Christians in America. I mean, that's all he really wants out of the whole world. Everybody else is going to burn in hell forever. Even the Muslims who believe Jesus was the Messiah, they just don't believe he was God in the flesh. So I guess they're going to find out, the Jews are going to find out, and I say the Christians are going to find out all about their religion, all about their faith. And so that's what I do the Bible study for for myself to really try and reinforce so that when that day comes, you know, I don't sound stupid. Well, but Jesus, I was casting out demons in your name, telling everybody how Jesus sent me here and Jesus did that for me. You know, how do I know? I'm I, most of the stuff I do seems out of my my you know completely conditioned selfishness. I you know I I love to feel generous and giving when the opportunity arises, but I'm certainly not out there giving half of my, you know, earnings away or half of my time or I don't know. When I think of the life that the master, you know, called us to emulate, at least his disciples, if you want to really follow him and not just believe in him from a detached vantage point of living like the world but believing in Jesus which is I think what was why most Christianity is lukewarm Western Santa Claus Christianity not these poor people in Africa and other places that are dealing with genocide and starvation and oppression I imagine those are the ones like in Sardis he said I know your poverty and suffering but you were rich <laughs> So, I don't know, right now I just assume being in poverty and be considered rich by Jesus than be considered rich by the world and be considered lukewarm when Jesus comes. If this is the time He's coming, then that seems to be a, a really relevant issue to Christians. And so, anyway, a couple of weeks ago I, I decided to start reading the book that's always been the toughest book in the Scripture for me. The one that I... I like to go back to the least because I always seem to get the least out of it. And in starting to read it again, a couple of weeks ago, I realized that the reason I'd always got so little out of it is because I had such a, a small vision of Christianity and of what God might really be, what Jesus might really have been in history. Um, and, and the way the teaching is really meant to affect the world through its expression in human beings that don't just believe in him, but are willing to therefore follow his teaching. And so I, I want to start going through the book of Job. Uh, Job, from what I've read in the past, is considered one of the oldest pieces of literature existing in the world, like Homer. You can see as we started, it's 
it's pre-Mosaic. There's no reference in Job to the you know, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the Law of Moses. So that's how old it is. And, and what it, I think the fact that it's canonized demonstrates that perhaps, unlike Enoch, it was preserved more thoroughly or readily alongside the other scriptures because it's, it's a different sort of perspective than Enoch's. But Job would seem to be something that dates from that perhaps post-flood time when Enoch would have been the reference or something like the writings of Enoch and, and whatever Noah and his sons had produced after the flood. All the arguments presented in Job are of the nature that you, you can imagine coming from Enoch. And so I want people to, to get that. There's no Jesus here. There's no Christianity here. There's no Judaism here. There's no sons of Abraham. This is just God and humanity. Right? It's a story about people and God and their relationship and how it all works. And it's, yes, it's probably like Homer. I mean, that's the way I read it. It's a wonderful poem. It's like a Homeric tale. It's, you know, I doubt it's verbatim. It didn't necessarily happen, although I challenge anyone to, to show me in the in this vast, incredible creation, especially coming from a mind, that any of these things couldn't have happened. You know, we even to the modern day, we have miraculous healings and people that defy, uh, I don't know, time space, you know, time travel, yogis and such, levitate. I mean, things have been purported all through time, right up until today, that are unexplainable. And so, I think it's, it's, um, it doesn't suit a metaphysic in which a God exists to imagine everything works like a, a mechanical clock in which part of the workings of that clock are what seem to be uh, ano anomalies, you know, events that aren't explained in the normal clockwork procedures. It, it's obvious that if you could stand back far enough, they're explainable in some form of the, of the system, is the way you'd have to see it. If you have a metaphysic where you got a personal God, then what doesn't fit? Doesn't the scripture say every, you know, every jot and tittle that of scriptures fulfilled that every, you know, there's, there's no strings left unattached. There's nothing out there but God, and God is all in all. And so anyway, I'm trying to get at a, a perspective of that that can reach our physical hearts, not just our intellectual mind, because if it doesn't move us to act, then it's not really faith, it's, it's belief. And I think we stay stuck in that traditional uh, conundrum of I believe in Jesus, Jesus died for me, I'm going to heaven. Boom. It's all, that's it. So that my increasing faith is simply sustaining the belief. 20 years from now, I can say my faith has increased. Why? Because I still believe the same thing I believed 20 years ago. Why has my faith increased? So I say it's because 20 years later, I found the nerve, I found the conviction, I found the strength, I found the argument to get myself to what? Give a little more to my neighbor. Give to, you know, to everybody essentially. Be, just be able to give of myself the way the master gave of himself. That can be the only measure of faith in his eyes, the way I see the scripture laying out. So I want to present that and now I want to get into Job as just a a way to analyze uh, the book of Job in light of what we can ascertain from our New Testament teaching of what Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, so now let's go all the way back 
before any of these covenants are made to when, you know, again, if it's a Homeric tale, it's still about men. It's a story about man's relationship with God. Don't get caught up in the idea that whether he had all the boils on him or, you know, lost all his kids and recovered them. You know, that could be part of the, the poem, but it still doesn't detract from a human being's life and their cares, their family and their investments and their, their gains and losses. I mean, that's what it's about and how all that interplays with our spiritual path with God and what it all means to us. And I think that's the question we're all coming to again today. I mean, that's what's going to become more important to us than our bank accounts at some point. I mean, Revelation, the sixth seal, talks about, you know, the bond man and the free man, the rich man and the poor man, everybody hiding in the rocks from him who sits on the throne. And so there's a great deception coming. And I imagine that believing in Jesus is quite a leg up. However, in this world of Santa Claus Christianity, the Jesus everyone has sold people of judging and condemning and hating is certainly not Jesus. I mean, it's, you know, that that's a false Christianity. And those people, I believe, are going to be brought into this deception. Christianity, the, the Zionistic Christianity, is being set up to be brought in to this great deception and be part of it. So that if the very elect could be fooled, I mean, they're going to see miracles, you guys. You're, we're all going to see miracles. And I, I imagine they'll be reported as miracles. It'll, be, it'll change the world is coming up, right? How many people are going to stand against that and say, no, he's not real? What do you mean? He's saying he's with Jesus. He's with Muhammad. He's with all these great masters. He's not Jesus, but he's, Jesus is with him. What are you going to say, Christian? So, they're going to show Christianity, I believe, to be a, the silliness and the hypocrisy that it is. And Christians are going to meanwhile be sucked into what keeps them afloat. Remember, you can't buy or sell without this mark. The whole world's going to worship the beast. Not under gunpoint. That's not worship. That might be obey. But that's not worship. He deceives the world, not strong arms the world into worshiping him. So, I don't know. I, I believe that the that a, most of modern Western Christianity is going to be part of the deception. And so, that's the nature of the Bible study these days. So, Book of Job, I think, can help us get into the heart of the matter from a different perspective. Instead of having to argue doctrine here, let's just look at a, a, a piece of literature presenting what we know from from the scholars of history and manuscripts this appears to be one of the oldest books that was ever written that we know of so chapter one there was a man in the land of ooze whose name was job and that man was innocent and upright and one who revered god and turned away from evil and there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. Notice right off the bat that he's measured in the way as we finished the book of Enoch a week or two ago. He's measured in that same sort of verbiage as Enoch would talk about. Innocent and upright who revered God and turned away from evil. Nothing about following God's law. Nothing about uh, you know, righteousness. Nothing about faith. Innocent and upright. And turned away from evil. A very black-white world is, is what I see, which is why it was such a condemnation not to stay on the side of God. It must have been much more obvious in Enoch's world and in Job's world 
where God was versus where the other side was. And much more of a conscious choice, therefore, and not such a brain-dead choice as modern Christianity is, is brainwashed into being so confused, into being the hypocrites and haters that they are instead of lovers and, and displayers of, of the, the mercy and forgiveness and love of Jesus. His substance, Job that is, his substance was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So here you get your poetic nuances, right? He's the greatest man of the East. He's a good man. He's the good king. Right? Remember, this is a long time before Plato now and the, and the early great thinkers that would leave us with the idea of what a great ruler of people, leader of people would look like. But this is how Job's described. Greatest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in the house of each other on his appointed day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were over that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now, so here we're introduced to burnt offerings, but nothing about a, right? There's no temple worship. There's, this is long before the law required burnt offerings. This is something we don't know the origin if this is reality. I don't see any reason it wouldn't be. But it, this was then codified into the temple eventually. But it, we don't, I don't recall in Enoch talking about burnt offerings. We have an altar in Enoch. Altar usually of fire, right? Here we have offering burnt offerings for his kids in case they've sinned. So is this something that comes out of Noah? Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence have you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking on it. Let's quickly pause to notice there, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Now, are these sons of God, Enoch's sons of God, that are the watchers? Right? These aren't men. These would be angelic beings, right? Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking on it? Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, an innocent, an upright man, one who reveres God and turns away from evil? Right? It's got all the, ver like the verbiage of Homer now that I consider it. The repeating of the, the lines for the, for the effect. I mean, I, I can clearly see it as something of a poem. But imagine the scene now. The, you know, what it puts in my mind, not whether these things actually took place and are being recorded as facts, but that whoever was recording this as a story was imagining that this was the sort of story a man would understand and relate to. So that this is, you know, what you can see is the way men saw the world and saw God. This is how they related it in a poem, in a legend about the greatest man who came up against God's reality and had to face that reality. And I, and I think that's why the book of Job is an important thing for us to, you know, to get into since, since we 
have a much deeper perspective on Christianity than than anyone I'm aware of, and I'm so uh, thankful for, for the group that follows this regularly. I think there must be something special about you folks. You're as crazy as I am, but you might also be as as thoughtful about the scriptures. Um, so. Anyway, I, I'm just keep trying to get us away from the. Tra- I'm breaking myself away from that traditional view of trying to put everything into this vision of a Christian world where all of every word of God's book is something God wrote for us to take to heart. If God said it in Job, it happened in time. You know, I doubt that very much. This this doesn't sound like that kind of story to me. Why does it have to be that way to be effective? to translate the nature of God to me. So anyway, that's what I'm going through in myself, and I don't know who else might be feeling that way, but I want you to, I want to try and see it more as a lesson in the nature of God and the nature of the relationship of God to humanity. And since it's back before any religions that we're aware of, we can take religion out of the picture altogether and just look at it as a story. I mean, since it's included in our canonized Bible, then something about this story so illustrates the relationship of God to man in the view of the people who canonized it, you know, that they included it where they didn't include, you know, Second Ezra or some other books that seem, the Apocrypha, that seem to be more obvious. So anyway, I, I, I keep feeling these, Asides are necessary, but I'll, we'll get into the meat of the story here. So the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, an innocent and upright man, one who reveres God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job revere God for nothing? Thou hast rested thy hand of protection upon him and upon his house and upon his children, and upon everything that he has everywhere. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and destroy all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. Right? Materialist. He's accusing Job. Well, sure, how hard is it to be happy when you're George Soros? But take it all away and you watch him tell you how much he reveres you. Does he revere God or does he revere money? Right? And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself you shall not put forth your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when the Job's sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said to him, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and robbers raided them and carried them away, and they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and only I have escaped to inform you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said to him, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the shepherds and consumed them, and I only have escaped to inform you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said to him, The Chaldeans divided themselves into three bands and raided the camels and carried them away and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and and I only have escaped to inform you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said to him, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only have escaped to inform you. So, I mean, if this doesn't sound like a poem to you, then you haven't read any good poems. You know, this is so brilliant. It's such a beautiful, brings you right into the moment, doesn't it? God gave devil the... Satan the power and Satan went right out and next thing you know Job hears about his whole world crashing down in a in a series of announcements and only I have escaped to inform you one of the ones that seemed interesting to me is the second one 
the fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the shepherds and consumed them. And I only have escaped to inform you. Now, we know from the passage before it wasn't the fire of God at all. It was God gave everything over into Satan's hand. But I guess if you want to say fire is God's fire, and they all knew that, fire is from God. So if fire came down from heaven, it's God's fire. But did they not know Satan can bring fire down from heaven? Didn't Satan, therefore, in this case, bring fire down from heaven? I mean, isn't that what's being recorded in the in the poem here? I'm not, again, trying to cross the line into into an academic argument. I'm just pointing out that in, even in the narrative, uh, it would seem Job's getting some false information where an act of God was not actually, we know like in a Hitchcockian way, that Job's being set up. The audience doesn't know what we know. Job's being set up. I mean, Job doesn't know what the audience knows. So Job's informed that he's lost everything. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all these disasters, Job did not sin, nor did he blaspheme against the Lord. That's obviously our, our lesson plan in this poem. But notice, you know, one of those famous sayings, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I mean, just happens to come from one of the oldest, you know, pieces of literature in the world. And here it is, out of the mouth of the, this character Job, having lost everything. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So it, you know, right off the bat, it presents me with a, a character uh, association of someone that can have everything. And remember, the greatest man of the East, who are we going to compare him to? You know, I compare him in the West to say George Soros or Bill Gates or somebody, right? Imagine one day being told you've lost everything and your kids, it's all gone. And what does he say? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So it, it's presenting us with the, with the, what's deemed at the time, obviously, the appropriate response to God in that way to, to recognize, not to, not to feel, hey, you know, what about all my stuff? How could you do this? What did I do? That kind of thing. But now you're going to see how all these sort of arguments become the natural human course. And I think that's why the book of Job, as I started reading it again, this again, for after many years, it really, it started striking me much different as having a tremendous impact on basic Christianity and the understanding when coupled with the way Jesus represented the spirit of God. To, to seeing the, you know, where the humility to live the life of a servant, to live outside of the measure of the world. I, I believe Job is a tremendous insight into that. So, okay, that was the first chapter. Chapter 2, so designated, begins... So it, it, chapter 1 ends that in all these disasters, Job did not sin, nor did he blaspheme against the Lord. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Whence have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, an innocent and upright man, one who reveres God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast to his integrity, although you provoked me against him to destroy him without cause. So now, isn't that an interesting way? You provoked me against him to destroy him without cause. That seems like either a, you know, the poet you know, kind of messed up his 
his narrative there, or it's meant to be, I don't know what, confused? Didn't God say, the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon himself you shall not put forth your hand. And now it says in the very, I mean, this isn't far along in the poem to be screwing it up at this point. Although you provoked me against him to destroy him without cause. So you can contemplate that, I suppose. I, I don't know what to make of that. It seems that an absolute contradiction, which makes it too obvious to be an accident in something so beautifully written. I mean, it keeps reminding me more and more of Homer in the way that it's written, where the lines are repeated and added to. And so, um, he still holds fast to his integrity, although you provoked me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord. It almost, to me, it, it says that, okay, even when God gives someone over into Satan's hand, it's still God's, world i mean it's all still got to be he's got to allow it so in that way god takes ultimate responsibility for everything you provoked me to allow him to be destroyed is the same as you provoked me to destroy him since i'm all in all I and mean, it's the only way i can reconcile it in this moment and Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, all that a man has he will give for his life to save it. But put forth thy hand now and touch his flesh or his bone, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is delivered into your hands. Only spare his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with cancer from the sole of his foot to his brain. I'm not sure how the word cancer got in here. Is that is there... Is that a word that's been around a very long time? Anyway, don't recall that. When I first read the book of Job in the King James Version 30 years ago, but perhaps I don't recall. Smote Job with cancer from the sole of his foot to his brain, and he took a potsherd to scrape himself with it, and he sat down upon ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> nice lady. That's the kind of encouragement you want after a lifetime of holding fast, huh? Let that be a lesson to us all, to, to be a different kind of encouragement for our spouses. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. We have indeed received God's blessings. Now shall we not all re also receive his afflictions? In all these misfortunes, Job did not sin, nor did he blaspheme against God with his lips. Now when Job's three friends heard of all his misfortune that had come upon him, they, sent, they set a time of meeting and came to him, every one from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Naamathite, the Naamathite, for they had made an appointment together to console and comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes from afar, they did not recognize him, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and threw dust upon their heads toward the heavens. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spoke a word to him, for they saw that his affliction was very great. I mean, I, interesting just in what's presented as what it means to see an old friend in pain. I mean, you not only rent your clothes and throw dust on your head, you sit down with them for a week without moving, without talking. I mean, I love it. Just, again, it just take you, take you back to, to hu uh, humanity. It's, it reminds me of the Christianity that tells you, you, you know, your faith's not strong enough. If your faith was strong enough, you could be healed. If your faith was strong enough, God would give you, you know, money. Those are the kind of people I basically grew up with. And, and just the most backstabbing, lying, 
sort of underhanded kind of people. So that can't be what proper faith and proper life produces. And so, as I say, that's why for me, I, I was at a point where, you know, why should I believe in Christianity when I look at Christians? I, I don't want to be one of them hypocrites, and I don't believe there's any possibility that if there is a God, that that's what, you know, when Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, I don't think you're seeing anything like Jesus when you see modern Christianity. I think you're seeing the Laodicean church that have a lot of beautiful stories about self-sacrifice. They have the story of the master himself and they've got the, you know, they're happy to play it out in movies like Mel Gibson's The Passion. Show us this man dying for you. But so if you don't have enough faith, <laughs> it, it never does rest on the fact that we're all supposed to be giving up this life for the next one. We're all supposed to be looking after each other to the point that there are no needy among us. I mean, that's the sign of a healthy Christian church. So the hypocrisy, and you see, what did Jesus accuse the Pharisees of? Hypocrites, hypocrites. You know, that's, that's what most of it came down to uh, when I read the, the New Testament record of what is claimed to to have been said by Jesus. You know, he calls the Pharisees on being money-loving, highfalutin hypocrites, right? For the most part, fakes. White on the outside like sepulchers on the hill, but full of death and corruption on the inside. So anyhow, that's um, back to Job and, and the three friends argument. And what we're trying to get at is, you know, the real spirit of of faith what's making job react the greatest man of the east lost everything and just says that's okay and his wife just tells him why don't you curse god and die already now you know now you're sick you know obviously this god you've been following hasn't been taking care of you must have been your own smarts that got you all them camels and all those sheep and he says you, you, you know you sound like one of the foolish women which means there's foolish women around that talk like that, right? There's foolish talk like that. So, you know, put yourself in a flesh and blood perspective, even though it's a, a poem, it's a poem about a time period that was obviously meant to reflect something to people. No poet writes something unintelligible. No writer attempts to write something unintelligible. It's it's exactly an antithesis of what you sit down to write or to tell a story to do. You're trying to relate something. And so the writer of Job's trying to relate what faith really is and what tests your faith. And right off the bat, you have, you know, you lose all the money. And so the right response for the upright man who turns away from evil and reveres God is to realize, well, all the money came from God. God, you know, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Naked I came into this world, naked I'll go out. That's okay. I mean, you know, that's, that's the correct response we're being presented with in Job. And, uh, and so then he, you know, then the spirit of Satan, or, you know, say in this story, but if you think of it in our religious context, that spirit of confronting us with our deeper test, Satan tells God, well, yeah, but skin for skin, a man will give everything to save his skin, right? So you lift your hand against his health and he'll curse you for sure. And boy, I've been sick the last week and I'll tell you, nothing brings you closer to God than being sick, does it, people? When you realize you hang, you know, you're, you're, you're any joy you have, any capacity to spend that money we hoard and all our stuff we keep from the people that need it. Uh, you know, boy, when we're sick, none of that means anything, does it? You can't use it anymore. And uh, you can't spend it anymore. And you'd spend every cent of it just to get better. Even if you're only better for another week and got sick again. So I tell you, you know, it really, when you're, when you're sick, you feel that closeness to God and that, 
that you're in in a in a very precarious position in the cosmos as a a human person living on this planet you're liable to i mean it's it's all terminal anyway you were born into a short term existence that might last a hundred years or so but any moment you might go that was the nature of buddha's inquiry at rock bottom you know you're going to die that's that's a gift everybody dies you know you're going to die but you don't know when you just don't know if this sickness will get you or if you'll make it through it you don't know if the you know, if the war you get conscripted into will kill you or the guy next to you. You don't know whether the, you know, the, the, the lightning will strike. So you just don't know and you can't protect against everything. And so you really, no matter what you convince your mind of, you're always on that edge of it being your last breath for some reason. And so that's why that relationship with God, the way I look at it through Job, you, you can see the, the centrality of it that we've lost. Remember the first commandment when the law comes along to show how far, as Paul taught, to, to display sin, not to invent sin, but just to show man. By Everybody knew you shouldn't kill or murder. But then the law said, thou shalt not murder, and now it gave real conviction to, to what the heart always knew. And so the law comes along, and the very first law is, you know, I'm your God. Have no other gods before me. Love God with your heart. You know, th this is the law that starts with knowing God. And so, again, how far have we come that even the Christians that are constantly praising Jesus and know that God raised Jesus, but do they know God? Because the Spirit of God, you said, you, you know, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he told those Jews, you say you believe Moses, but Moses taught about me. And Moses knows me, you don't know me. If you knew Moses, you'd love me. He told the Christians, if you, if you love me, you'll follow me. You'll do what I say. You know, you'll trust me. This is the way of God, not the way you're, the world is going. They're buying and selling, getting ahead of each other. That's not the spirit of God. That's anti-Christ, right? That's, that's a, this whole beast system, I think, really comes down to. It's what is the opposite of God's spirit. And there finally comes one to sit at the head of that whole power system and and that's what the time that we're living in and why there'll be no way to overcome that except with real faith i believe and i'm not sure all this you know we believe in jesus we believe in jesus i think that's going to get tested like it did with job you're still going to be saying that when they take all your stuff you're still going to be saying that when you're dying of these diseases that they're going to give us all or are you going to be going I, you know, what happened? I followed Jesus, and right? So, I, I say we're all going to face that here. So, let's get to some of the arguments from Job's friends and see how Job faces the arguments when they come. So, uh, they sat down, his friends come, and they see he's so, he's so bad looking that they cry. They weep, and, and then they sit, they, they, Every one rents his own mantle. And I, I haven't looked that up to see what, you know, it, it must be part of your clothes. That's what they used to do. You tear your robe, right? So that's what I'm thinking it is. Someone could correct me if that's not the case. Uh, so they rent their clothes is what I'm thinking and, and uh, threw dust upon their heads, which seems to be one of the oldest signs of, of such uh, distress. That's what we're told King David did when he found out Absalom was killed. So, uh, and they sit down with him on the ground for seven days and 
They see his afflictions. They just don't. They don't even say a word. They sit down on the ground with him for seven days. I mean, at least that's the way the poem. But again, is he is this d- displaying something that his or her contemporaries would laugh at, or is this displaying something that would move the hearts of the poet's contemporaries? So it must have had uh, somewhat of a a note of reality to it in the surreal sense that the whole poem is is uh, given. Okay, so what we call chapter 3 opens now with Job responding to the, his friends arriving and his condition. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day wherein he was born. Then Job spoke and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived, let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let the darkness and the shadow of death cover it. Let a cloud overshadow it. Let those whose days are bitter be terrified by it. As for that night, let thick darkness cover it. Let that day not be reckoned in the number of the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let that night be desolate. Let no voice of praise come therein. Let them curse it who curse the day, who are ready to stir up Leviathan. Let the stars of twilight thereof be dark. Let the people wait for light, but receive none. Neither let them see the dawning of the day, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die from the womb? Why did I come forth at birth? Why was I reared at my mother's knee? Why did I suck the breasts? For now I should have been laid in the grave and been quiet. I should have slept, then I should have been at rest. With kings and governors of the earth who built desolate places for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver, or like a hidden untimely birth, as if I had not been, like infants that never saw the light. There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners rest together, they hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in trouble, and life to the bitter in soul? Who long for death, but it comes not and seek it as one seeks a hidden treasure, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid, whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat, and my moanings are poured out like water. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has befallen me. I am not at ease, neither am I calm, nor am I at rest, and yet misfortune came. So, you know, imagine what he's bemoaning sounds like what I consider the cultural imperative that's been inflicted on everybody, you know, Americans and Western Europeans and most of the world, but this cultural imperative, you know, and you look back at this time period, what was he seeking? I'm not at ease, neither am I calm, nor am I at rest. So what do we really want? What have we always wanted? To be at ease, to be calm, and then eventually to be at rest, which I think he's referring to, you know, dead. To be at ease, to be calm, and then dead. You know, that's, that's the life you, you follow the, the good path to find, right? And what he's been saying, or what you'll find Job is going to insist on, very soon is that he's followed that path and look where it's led and how is that possible and why was I born for this right he's not blaming God he's just saying curse the day you know why why couldn't I have died why couldn't I be at rest he brings that vision of like Enoch of Sheol right which he'll mention again so even though it's a little vague here you can tell from where he mentions it that when he says, I should have been laid in the grave and been quiet, I, I should have slept and then I should have been at rest with kings and governors of the earth who built desolate places or with princes. And he goes on to say, there the wicked cease from troubling and there the weary are at rest. 
So he keeps referring to it as a there, and, and later he's going to mention it as Sheol. So we can um, ascertain that that's what the poet's talking about. He's talking about this place of abode for the soul. You know, my soul's going to go down like this, right? That that was obviously a sign of someone who was wicked, and and that's what his friends bring out uh, very soon in his story. But here's his first lament to them. You know, curse the day I was born. How's you know? How is it possible? What you know? He he knows he's never followed the path toward this kind of result, and you'll find out in this book that we're talking about a different time period where where we learned cor- sort of in the beginning the black and whiteness of it: those who turn away from evil and those who don't, kind of thing. You might you might say it's as easy now, but it's it's not. The law came to show us all our sinfulness. God said there's none righteous. Not one makes God happy with their actions. So see, we don't live that spirit of God. All I'm saying is if you go back to Job, back to this time, you're that much closer to that spirit. And the, the uh, even though it had already fallen away so far, right? So... Anyway, Job is also pointing out here something that gives us a view of this time and and what they consider great evil or whatever, the mention of Leviathan, right? Let them curse it who curse the day who are ready to stir up Leviathan, right? Talking about the day of his birth. The sort of, that he's associating this example of his life as such an extreme uh, curse, right? The, the the greatest curse of all, this Leviathan. This is the great evil in old ancient writings, as far as I understand. It represented that that great darkness or dark force, dark power. So anyway, the, chapter three is his lament about the day of, you know, why could, why did it have to be this way for me? I'm, I'm sure we can all, I, I can certainly grasp that. I had my moments the last few days when I wonder, you know, is this the, is this the great sickness? Is this, you know, is this the way that, that these things happen? How do I know I'm going to get better? What, whose hands am I in? And how does it, how does that happen? And so uh, I think we can all feel for this character here who's, you know, why do I have to be born for this? What I'm trying to reflect on is the historical significance in the, uh, it's not just that he's lost his goods and his health, as you'll find out in the argument, it's the way in which it's all come upon him is a complete it's as if as if you were told that you had to sin to be close to God you may know that's not possible and I've never you know I would never feel that way I'd never do that and yet this is what suddenly you're you're confronting here and that is that's a terrible example but what I suppose I want to say is Job's confronting true faith in in this and it's going to be tested by his friends and the reason I'm taking a minute here and I think it's so important is because the test isn't what we would consider a test the arguments aren't the way we would argue it that's why you got to get your mind around this historical perspective of when things were much more black and white when Job being an upright man who turns away from evil and reveres God expects to live a long healthy blessed life like he was living even though he acknowledges the Lord takes away, he still doesn't. He still doesn't get it. He hasn't done anything to deserve that treatment, because the whole way everything works in this time. Of Job's time, is that those who follow the Lord get blessed, and those who don't get cursed. At least this is the way the poem is going to display to the people 
the consciousness now of the friends, which is, you know, your basic humanity around you in the way of this poem. So, so he finally laments that he's not at ease and he's not calm and he's not at rest and yet misfortune came. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If I venture to speak with you, will you be wearied? But who can restrain himself from speaking with you? Right? He's acknowledging you look so tired, you know. I feel like I have to say something, but I'm not sure if you can take it. Behold, you have instructed many. This is now Eliphaz talking to Job. Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld the weak. You have strengthened the feeble knees. But now, because misfortune has come upon you, and you are weary, it touches you, and you are terrified. Behold, your fear is to be blamed, and your trust in the integrity of your way. Remember, I pray you, who ever perished being innocent, or where were the upright ever put to shame? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion and the voice of the young lion are silenced, and the teeth of the lions are broken. The lion perishes for the lack of prey, and the whelps of the lioness are scattered. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little of it. In silence, in a night vision, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. Then I arose, but I could not discern its meaning. There was no form before my eyes, but I heard a gentle voice saying, Shall mortal man be declared more righteous than God? Shall he be more pure than his Maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his messengers he struck with amazement. Even those who dwell in decorated houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, shall be humbled before the thick darkness. They shall be afflicted from morning to evening, that they may not dwell forever. Yeah, they shall perish. Behold, their possessions are taken away from them, and the rest of them shall die without wisdom. So he's pointing out that nobody's going to be that good, right? In the end of his argument, we'll get back to the beginning in a moment, but the end seems to be that in his dream, shall mortal man be declared more righteous than God? Shall he be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants. God, I think, talking about. God put no trust in his servants. And his messengers he struck with amazement. Even those who dwell in decorated houses of clay, which must be the rich in those days, right? Those who dwell in the big houses with the Ferraris out front, whose foundation is in the dust, shall be humbled before the thick darkness. In other words, every, nobody's, nobody's getting away with outdoing God. God's going to lay everybody low. That seems to be Eliphaz's dream answer. But now in the beginning, he says... He definitely makes the point, which I was trying to set us up for with that long and arduous, boring uh, interlude about the history of it. Because you can see that this isn't the way we feel today. Who's ever... Uh, remember, I pray you, whoever perished being innocent. Well, hell, that's... Every, what do you mean? Who didn't, you know... All the, all the Holocaust, all the genocides, all the Native Americans, all the, you know, the poor people of Syria today. You know, what do you mean? Whoever perished being innocent. Everybody. So his argument obviously is meant to say something to the people of his time. That's how long ago we're talking. When to them, people having this sort of calamity happen to them, that comes from God according to Eliphaz, right? As I have seen, this is Eliphaz speaking, as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. 
The roaring of the lion and the voice of the young lion are silenced, and the teeth of the lions are broken. Meaning, don't mean you know, lions are not. God will silence you. So he's accusing him of having sown some sort of trouble. He's plowed some sort of iniquity. I mean, there's no other answer for it. And then his dream confirms that, you know, come on now. God's bringing you low. Who's going to be good like God? Who's going to? Who's going to live it to the end without being brought low? Even the people in, dwell in decorated houses of clay. Be humbled before the thick darkness. They shall be afflicted from morning to evening that they may not dwell forever. Yeah, they shall perish, right? Yeah, nobody's living forever. No matter how good you are. It's that, that goodness doesn't go on forever and ever. God's blessing, you die too, right? Anyway, um, today's version might have been a little bit difficult. I, it'll be patched together by Dad because this new program that they put on my computer was... I didn't know how to use it. I got interrupted yesterday and had to put the rest of it together today. So forgive the nature of this one, but... I hope you'll stick with me. I mean, there's been that small group of you that have, and I really appreciate it. Job, I think there's a lot of fun stuff to get out of here, a lot of really meaningful uh, research to do as a Christian, if, if you're going to look at it that way. And, uh, and so I just want to reflect again on the days we're living in and the importance these days is, you know, is really a job and a career. I mean, I've had dreams for a long time. I've been trying to build things for the surf industry. I, I've designed a lot of things that I dream about making. But, you know, more and more I am less and less inclined to, to feel that that's what's important. I mean... You know, get, getting into the market right now? Are you kidding? Does that make any sense? That doesn't make any sense. I, you know, I, I feel we're very fortunate that the, the whole electronic world is still up. And I know that God will do whatever he needs to do to get this word to whoever needs to hear it. But, you know, I wonder if the, you know, if the lights went out tomorrow, you 30 people or whatever that listen every week, you're know, the only ones in the world that that sort of see Christianity in any light that I've found. Most of the rest of the world only sees the light of false Christianity being false, but they don't see true Christianity being relevant at all. And, and the way that Jesus had told the disciples that they were going to display that to the world was by being servants and giving of this light. And that, if the people could see that and believe it and put that into action, the whole world would know that he was the Messiah. You just know. Everybody's following this Jesus guy, and the result is there's just no needy. There's just no war. There's just no hate. Everybody's just giving even unto their life for this. I mean, you, you couldn't stop something like that. And I think that's going to be part of the whatever this millennial kingdom, this next phase in which, you know, the Messiah himself rules the world. You know, it's an opportunity to, to, to live in a creation like that. And it's the brilliant, that's the brilliant part about being a Christian, I believe, is not, you know, the burden of being a Christian is almost impossible to carry for me. I, I, I can hardly face the idea of what it would mean if Jesus came to town and I had to just jump in behind his followers and follow him, sell everything I have and give it to the people that are hungry. What do I need? A closet full of clothes to choose from, and several pair of shoes to choose from, and several surfboards to surf with. You know, what, what do I, why is that all such a, you know, the defining things about my life is, Mostly my capacity to engage my, my surroundings and my culture. And it's, you know, it's been a, a fixed measure for me that that would be determined by how much buying capacity, how much 
stuff I had, the quality of the stuff I have. You know, and if Jesus came to town, would he care? Oh, I see you got an extra surfboard, you know? Why don't you give that to somebody? Oh, I see you got a drawer full of shirts. Did you know how many people in your town don't have one single shirt? You know, that's all I can say him saying to me if we met tomorrow on the street here. You know, nice to meet you. God, you got a lot of stuff, you know? Don't you know how many people don't have anything? Is that the way you think? Is that, you know, are you following me? So I just say, if we're in the end times, you're expecting Jesus to return. What do you want him to see you doing? (laughs) Uh, You know, that's so, so anyway, the Bible study right now, I, I really want to focus on the whole basic Christian, you know, what does it mean? What are we trying to achieve being a Christian? You just want to be saved. And, you know, I say you're playing a dangerous game. He says the lukewarm Christians will be spit out of his mouth. I don't think that means unsaving, but it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound like what we've all been, you know, trying to achieve all these years. So anyway, I just want to keep attempting that encouragement. And I, I think if you'll stick with Job here in the next couple of few weeks, there's a lot to glean out of it. It's a very interesting study. So thanks for being here. Keep loving your neighbor. I hope that we're inspiring that in you. Please subscribe to Bro Sal and share us with, with your friends and maybe send them some of our shorter things like the Santa Claus Christianity we did to be kind of an advertiser of what false Christianity is. You know, share that with Christians, you know, see, see what they say. I don't know. It's it's, it's up to each of us. Like Dad said when he started the ministry years ago, it's, it's one, one light at a time. We each are our own little light that is burning inside us. And we're sharing that light, you know, one light, you know, lighting up the world one light at a time. So it's, that's all we can do except to follow the Master. That's what, that's what we really need to try and do. I mean, you know, Go give some clothes to somebody. Go give some food to somebody. Go send some money to send to somebody. You know, and and do it with love in your heart because you know, man, money, that's so much better out of your hands and into the hands of someone else. Then it's their responsibility to love with it. If you're loving with it, man, you you're right with God. And if God's coming quickly, and where else do you want to be? So we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for being here. God bless.